All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's event. Uh, my name is Dr. Joe Palazzari. I'm a clinical psychologist here at St. Joseph's Healthcare Hamilton. I'm coming to you from my office at the Charlton campus of St. Joe's in downtown Hamilton. Um, I've been part of uh, staff support initiatives here at our hospital, and I've been connected with this group, this regional group, uh, who has been hosting and organizing these virtual events. And this is actually our seventh event that we're having um, with the topic of courageous conversations, communicating in challenging times. And this is part two. Um, and, and it's okay if, if, if you didn't get part one, because um, we're going to do a bit of a, of a review. But I, I just want to warmly welcome everyone. Um, indeed, there are still challenging times, aren't there? Um, and uh, um, uh, last week was strange with some of the mask mandates uh, here at the hospital, but, you know, I think we, we keep on rolling with this. Um, and uh, and I want to kick off this event as we do usually with a land acknowledgement before getting into the goals of our sessions. Uh, and then uh, I'll let uh, our co-facilitator, Bahar Karimi, also introduce herself. But let's start with the land acknowledgement. Sorry, uh, Shopi, I know I'm bouncing around a bit here, but let's start with the land acknowledgement. This is the one from my hospital, from St. Joe's Helm. We at St. Joseph's Healthcare Hamilton and across our network of, of collaborators and uh, today recognize that the lands on which we provide care are the traditional territories of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee peoples. For thousands of years, and the first people sought to steward the precious resources and share this land with others. These territories are the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between nations to peaceably share and care for the lands around the Great Lakes. At St. Joseph's Healthcare Hamilton and across our network, we pledge to continue to walk together with Indigenous peoples in building a more just society where their gifts and those of all people are nurtured and honored. Very good. So again, welcome back to our Hope, Healing and Recovery Exchange, our seventh installment. Please go on YouTube if you want to catch the others. Uh, encourage people to, to do that and uh, always uh, welcome these opportunities to connect with others. Um, I'm co-facilitating the event today. Uh, Bahar, would, did you, would you like to introduce yourself? Thanks so much, Joe. Welcome, everyone. My name is Bahar Karimi. I'm the Executive Director of Long-Term Care Services at Thrive Group, overseeing St. Peter's residents at Shadok and Ottawald Manor long-term care homes in Hamilton. I'm also the chair of the Center of Excellence at Thrive Group, and I'm also a full-time PhD student at Western University. Um, very privileged to be able to contribute to these sessions. Um, I was a speaker in one of the sessions, and this is the second time I'm co-facilitating with Joe, and it's an honor to be here, and welcome to all of you. Joe, do you want me to go through the welcome? Yeah, room? just uh, just some ground rules, everyone. Um, please, you know, consider this uh, a safe space uh, to share. Um, please know that the event will be recorded. However, um, uh, you'll be muted during uh, the talk. Uh, you will be able to enter questions into the chat, um, and that'll be available for you to ask questions of us. And we're gonna hopefully plan a longer Q&A session with you today on this topic. And please know a list of resources uh, will be available to you as well as a link to an evaluation uh, that will be shared by email after the session. Thanks, Karimi. Bahar, sorry. Thanks so much, Joe. Um, so for some of you that uh, might be new to these sessions, um, we, we're just going to go th quickly through the goals of the, the sessions, the whole healing and recovery ex uh, exchange sessions. It's to honor the diverse experiences of health and community care workers in our community, 
and promote collective reflection and mutual support, hear personal stories of overcoming challenges and reflection from others, and increase awareness of available resources. And we also would like to acknowledge the many partners who have contributed to these um, sessions and this work, including our presenters today. And on that note, um, I am very pleased to have Scott Page with us today. Uh, Scott Page is a registered psychotherapist at Hamilton Family Health Team and Waterstone Therapy, uh, working in private practice, uh, and with the Hamilton Family Health Team. He's an associate professor of psychiatry and behavioral neuroscience at McMaster. Scott has also worked with HHS, St. Joseph's Hamilton, Healthcare Hamilton, and Wesley here in Hamilton in therapist, spiritual care provider, and director roles. Scott, we're honored to have you here. Well, well thank you for that warm introduction. Uh, yeah, I'm excited to kind of have this chance to run through um, these tools. If you were here last time, this is going to be a bit of a repeat, um, but the idea would be that we can kind of ground in this tool and then move forward from there so we can go into the, the next slide here. So uh, objectives today for me look like uh, primarily I want to give you a format. I think in conflict, having a clear tool can be very helpful so that you can focus, particularly if you're in initiating a conflict. Um, I want to orient you to a little bit of the way that you may experience um, using a tool like this in conflict and, and, and sort of how to perceive and, and address some of those obstacles. And really, my biggest interest here is keeping it practical. Um, we can get high level and that high level stuff is very important too, um, but I want to give you a thing that you can do to address conflicts better. Uh, I don't have any conflicts of interest to report in regards to this subject, so we can... So the tool I'm going to be walking you through today is Dear Man. It's from um, the, a mode of therapy called Dialectical Behavioral Therapy. And really the intent of this is when you have an objective that you're trying to achieve. This would be distinct from times that you're, when you're addressing conflict and you're trying to focus on you know, establishing connection. This is primarily about objective. So I'm going to give you an example of a conversation that looked like this um, for me. And then when I run through this example, um, I'll give you the context of the tool, and then at, we'll, we'll wrap up. I sh I'll show you how kind of I apply it. So um, the instance I can think of where I had to, I found this tool effective um, in my own life was I was coming home from the grocery store with my kids uh, to a house that I was living in in downtown Hamilton. Uh, so it had been a couple years back. When I get home, I see my neighbor chopping down trees in uh, on the shared property line. Um, and I go over and I talk to him. I say, hey, what's going on? He's like, oh, I'm, I'm chopping down these trees here uh, because I'm going to put a pool right over here. And he points to uh, the space right next to our shared wall and a couple feet away from an addition on my house. And he says, I'm going to put uh, a deck that extends from either uh, from fence line to fence line here. So I'm taking down the trees to have that up. And my stomach kind of drops and I feel that nervousness of like, oh, I'm going to have to have a conversation with this guy who I really actually liked and had a good relationship with up to that point. Just, ugh. Fortunately, my kids um, are loud enough to pull me inside and we come back to, um, I, I get some time to kind of center myself and think, okay, what do I want to do with this conflict? So this tool is what kind of, um, I use in that instance and I'll walk you through what the tool looks like. So dear man, two parts. Dear, which is the what you're saying, man, which is the how you say it. So the dear part, first we're going to start with describe. This is the indisputables. That would be the things that me and the other person in the conflict would necessarily agree to. And oftentimes, the challenge here is to not try to squeeze everything into this category. You know, you're not trying to convince the person of your opinion. You're trying to say, what is the, what is the reality that we're sharing? In, in reference to like legal categories, this would be kind of like discovery. What are the, what are the agreed upon facts? Um, once you're doing that, you're moving into expressing. This is where you're owning your own space. How do I think and feel about this? What is going on inside of me that makes me feel like some kind of conflict is necessary here? Um, a lot of I statements. I feel scared. I feel worried. I feel frustrated um, because, you know, this and that belief or, or understanding of the world that I'm holding and owning that as my own. I'm not expecting the other person to share that, but I'm not dismissing my own thoughts as important and meaningful because they are. Um, 
after I'm kind of expressing my position, I'm going to move to assert. Here is where I'm asking, I'm stating very clearly the what I want to have happen. Um, and it's not going to be an assert is rarely successful if it's I want you to agree with me on everything I've ever said, or I want you to acknowledge that you're wrong in everything you've ever done. It's just not going to happen. Your assert you want to be a small, meaningful thing. I want you to do X, Y, Z that is within your power. I want these kind of actions to happen. Or And then the last bit of this is reinforcing. Why is it going to be of benefit to me and the other person in this conflict to have happen? The easy part of that is usually figuring out why it's going to benefit me. The, the hard part is having a sense of why it's going to benefit somebody else. But uh, ideally, this this reinforcing helps it turn from, hey, you and I are having a conflict where we're disagreeing on this particular item. And instead, how are we both trying to work together to get these outcomes that we both kind of want? The next bit of dear man is the, is the how you say it bit. Um, mindfulness is a lovely word that gets used for a lot of things. The definition kind of gets broader, uh, the longer it's kind of in our common vocabulary. In this particular context, I'm thinking about mindfulness as being um, non-judgmentally aware of what is happening in the present moment, both in terms of the world around me, the sensations that are coming into my body, and the thoughts and feelings that I'm experiencing. Um, in terms of a conflict, mindfulness looks about like setting an appropriate context. It's not picking a con time for a conflict where I'm like, oh, there's like, you know, <laughs> a bunch of other people going around, or this person has just left something that's really challenging for them and might not be in their best place, trying to pick a moment thoughtfully maybe even an intentional invitation. Another part of it could be about the way I manage myself, right? Am I aware, am I taking that time to reground and, hey, how do my hands feel? Am I sweaty? Am I hot? Not being judgmental about that, but being aware of the signals my body is giving me. It's also being mindful in the present moment of what is my objective? What am I doing here? We call that the broken record um, because you're often, you know, you get, you get, you, the needle gets bumped and you go, okay, we're going right back to where we were, right? If you're on the dear man path and you're describing the situation and someone says, oh, yeah, but you also did this other thing, you know, you always, you never, um, you know, all the, this last time this happened, you were this way. And yeah, okay. That's not, not important. It is important. What I'm describing is this, um, a return to that. Appear confident. Um, I don't mean like, appear confident doesn't mean like, um, uh, uh, arrogant or braggadocious it means more like think about that your best middle school teacher and their ability to stand in a classroom of screaming kids and talk slowly and quietly and bring the attention of the group to them by not moving that's that's the confidence rarely is appearing confidence going to look like they're getting louder you're getting louder right it's often getting smaller to draw the person in not avoiding but small and direct right and then the last thing would be being in a stance of, of negotiating. Now, that doesn't mean that you're just going to give your ask away and say, oh, never mind, what I want doesn't matter, but rather being in a being willing to give to get, right? This kind of stance of, um, again, we're both working on the same team, looking at this problem. How can you and I come to a solution to make this thing work? If you're getting a lot of no, I won't, I can't, um, I shouldn't have to, saying, okay, well, here's what I'm saying is the reinforcer that I want to have happen. How's a way that you think we can get there? And having helping the other person kind of um, encouraging them to be like collaborative in terms of finding that solution together if, if you're getting a, a straight out just kind of no. So some um, how to do this better. Conflict is really hard. Uh, no human being, I think, well, maybe some human beings. I don't know a lot of human beings who are really good at this right up jump. It's a practice thing. So you got to lower your expectation for resolution. This is not going to be like a movie where it's just like, you can't handle the truth. And then the whole truth comes out and everyone agrees and knows the same fact at the end. It doesn't happen. Uh, if it does, it doesn't happen with me. Um, more what we're looking for is a resolution where there's a clear ask, demonstrable steps that could happen towards the objective. The other thing you need to lower an expectation for is your own calm. You know, if you're sweaty, if you get that lump in your throat, if you can feel your heart beating, that's not a sign that you're failing. That's a sign that you really care about what's happening in that moment. And that's just an invitation to yourself to say, hold on, slow down. Because the other part of that really caring is the complicated thoughts get slowed and you got to follow that pace. Be, don't expect to be your smartest, brightest self in the middle of a conflict because you won't be. 
The other way that you can do this better, and this isn't always possible, but when it is possible, it's a really good idea, I think, is to prepare in advance. That looks, for me, like I like to put the letters down and write out my bullet points. Not that I'm going to necessarily carry that with me, but it gives me that chance to make a clear line. And rehearsing. Um, the best way I like to rehearse is with someone who cares about me, but isn't really involved in the conflict. Um, so that they can kind of be an audience to help me rehearse this. The more deep set in my memory the dear man structure is, the more likely I am going to be able to stick to where I want to go rather than getting pulled off into the into the weeds and, and into a conflict that becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And bigger. So I'll describe for you here kind of how I, I use this myself and, and um, we'll, we'll move on from there. So in this instance, when I... Uh, had the conversation next, I sent a text to my neighbor, said, hey, can we talk a little bit, set up a time and place that work for both of us, stand out in the front yard, have an awkward conversation. Um, so I started by describing the situation. When I came home earlier, it was actually the, uh, that day, earlier today, I saw you, you cutting down those trees um, and you're saying you're gonna put a swimming pool you know, in this kind of general area and you're, um, and you're planning to build the stack express. I felt nervous about that. Uh, and I'm worried about a couple things. I'm worried about the resale value of my house with a big pool of water that close to, to, to where it is. And I'm, uh, and, and, and perhaps being close to something that's not legally conforming. I'm also worried about the safety of my own kids because I know an unfenced pool or a pool that's not fenced correctly can be really dangerous. So I'm, I'm kind of worried right now. Assert. So what I'd really like for you to do is um, look into what the permitting rules are and the setback rules are for pools and look into the Hamilton uh, building code about that and, and let me know what you find and reinforce. So that way you can go ahead and build whatever it is that you can build that was gonna make your backyard feel great to you. And then I can be have some relief from your worries. Now this conflict, like every conflict was awkward um, and it wasn't like it felt good when it was done. There was some tension. There's certainly some having to pull back into the conversation. But ultimately, having a structured, clear way to go through this meant that that awkwardness lasted for that time and about a month after that. And then after that, we kind of go back to being the neighbors that we were before. And um, I feel much better about having done that than having to avoid a conflict and then have to look at something you know, every day for years and years on end that is um, making that resentment and perhaps would lead to even a worse relationship longer term. So that's Dear Man in a nutshell. Um, I'm eager to hear any questions or concerns and application um, stuff that we might have. And call it there. That's awesome. Thanks so much, Scott. And if you don't mind, we'll keep the questions uh, for the end after Jesse uh, presented. Mm -hmm. And this, this structure is very interesting because I think as we go through uh, real life scenarios and working through the structure, then it will become second nature. So maybe for the first few scenarios, we'll, we'll need to think about the structure and what the steps are to work through it, but then it probably will become, for you probably it's, it's second nature to you while you're going through um, uh, conversa uh, courageous conversations, you don't need to even think about the structure. That was very well done. Thanks so much, Scott. Um, and now um, I am very pleased to present Jesse Tolan to you. Uh, Jesse is currently the manager of the emergency department at St. Joseph's Healthcare Hamilton. Previously, Jesse has experience as a quality improvement and patient safety leader in both the public and private sectors. She obtained her Master of Science in Nursing, where she focused her studies on the application of high re reliability in healthcare with a special interest in nursing situation awareness and decision making. Jesse, it's an honor to have you here. Thank you so much. Um, so today we're uh, I'm going to be speaking about exploring the gap. Um, and so if we can move to the next slide. When we hear the word conflict, I know that some of us get this sweaty feeling. <laughs> we feel uncomfortable. We just want to go, oh. Um, and that is totally normal. Um, however, when we look, and if you were to Google conflict, if we go to the next slide, we hear words like it's destructive. It can be avoided. We can manage it it's challenging it's you know we have difficulty there's drama there's usually a winner and loser conflicts can be thought of as 
Um, you know, you're going to be the bad guy, right? Um, that there's going to be a struggle. Someone has to be justified, right? There's aggression. All of these things that we think about when we hear conflict, when we Google conflict, kind of gives us this like subtle message that, um, you know, that it does need to be managed, reduced, resolved. And when we're not respecting that tension that happens in conflict, we then um, can uh, not have the opportunity to share ideas, share, um, you know, concerns that we have. We're not doing right by, you know, ourselves, by the other individual. Maybe we're making assumptions, et cetera. So when we go to the next slide, we talk about what if we reframed it and we thought of that conflict was an opportunity rather than coming into conflict saying, oh, this is going to be so awful. And, you know, this is going to be difficult. Of course, it's going to be difficult, you know, and, and challenging. Um, but if we set ourselves up into a space where we thought this is an opportunity to be creative, to, um, to learn, to have compassion, to have a diversity of ideas, um, to practice empathy, to improve teamwork, to really accelerate change, right? If we think of any big change that's happened within the world, that someone had to have conflict at some point, right? Somebody had a different idea. Um, and so in order to create, you know, and to respect that tension, um, let's reframe how we're thinking. And from the quality side, if we go to the next slide, we talk a lot about problems and problem being the gap between, you know, uh, what, um, you know, what is happening and what should be happening or the current and desired state. And really, if we think about conflict in the same way, this was just transformational for me because then it was able to say, I love to solve problems. I'm good at solving problems. I love to solve problems with people. And it helps us put us on the same team if we're saying, you know what, we're exploring this gap. So there's a gap between what I want or what we want and what we are experiencing what is actually that gap? And so um, the way that we can then, um, you know, respect that tension that happens, because really conflict is just energy, right? And it's not good, it's not bad. It can create energy and it's, we can either choose to create drama or are we gonna choose to, again, struggle with the individual, you know, be able to ask these questions and have that opportunity for something even better. So if we go to the next slide, Really, when we, the importance of asking the right questions is that it helps us open that com communication. It shows that you're authentically interested. You're showing curiosity for that person. Um, again, that collaboration, I'm asking for your help for this problem, right? I could still have issues maybe with what they're doing, but I need your help to understand what your perspective was during whatever happened, let's say. Um, it helps to build trust and understand that root cause or that alternative perspective, you might not have all the information. They might not have all the information. Um, we wanna understand the goals and priorities. Maybe our goals and priorities or our values are, are different. And so, you know, being able to identify that piece. And again, being able to create value. So I'm gonna go back to the quality improvement, patient safety, of course, right? If we're able to, um, you know, raise our concerns, raise our, our ideas that we have for things like safety, for example, which is, as we know, is one of the biggest, um, healthcare harm is one of the biggest uh, reasons for you know injury and all those sorts of things. Imagine if we all felt comfortable in speaking up in the same space to, to bring forward those concerns, those ideas, um, those opportunities. So this really helps to be able to um, um, just set the stage for, again, that collaboration. So if we go to the next slide, before we get to the exploration, I find it really important for me to really get clear on what my goal is for the conversation and to say it out loud to the other individual so that they know where I'm coming from. And when I think about our jobs in healthcare, it's really, we have three jobs and that is to care for our patients, to care for each other and to uh, improve how we do things. So one and two is easier. That's really it. That's, that's our jobs. <laughs> and um, so I have these kind of in my back pocket generally when we talk about, you know, someone comes up to you right away or something like that and they want an answer right now. Um, but, uh, you know, so for, for my patients who, if they have a complaint um, or they want to talk, give some constructive feedback, you know, my goal is for you to feel cared for or my goal is for you to get the best care possible. How can we go about doing that, right? So starting from there, 
Um, same thing with my healthcare workers. So my goal is for you to be successful or, um, and, uh, you know, in order to do that, like, let's talk this through, right? Um, so um, those are kind of the things that I kind of ground myself in because then I'm able to not only start off the conversation in a way where we're both understanding what the intent is, but um, also then it's that anchor to pull us back when we start going off filter. If we go to the next slide. This is the part where we just actually start to explore the gap with questions. Um, and so asking good questions is essentially about just being curious that I, you know, I'm not going to have assumptions. I'm just, I'm going to ask my who, what, when, where, and how I'm going to give you a bonus tip that why sometimes is seen as um, adversarial that you're saying what you did was wrong. Um, so when we look at that literature, that's, you know, some of the things that come out when we say, Hey, why did this happen? Or why did you do this? Of course, that can sound a little off-putting. Um, so instead, we can, you know, change our uh, question to be, "Tell me how this came about," or um, "How did that decision make sense at the time?" Right? Like you're asking for different types of information. You're going to hopefully get actually what you're intending, and then keep the um, the energy a little bit more um, level-headed. Um, I also like to use um, the collaborative we. So how are we going to fix this? Or how are we like, let us look into this. And again, asking for help. I need your help to understand X, Y, and Z. I have a few things, especially when I first started, uh, you know, getting into um, uh, difficult conversations is you have a few things in your pocket that feel right for you. So can you help me understand? I wonder, or I'm curious about, um, how do we know this to be true, right? What does that look like for you? So for example, patient safety, what does that look like for you, right? So um, being able to have those discussions. Um, the other thing is during the discussion to ensure that you're using statements that validate the other person's perspectives that might help you go back to your goal or remembering what the gap is um, and really keeping about the process versus the concern. So again, really understanding what their gap is too, right? So when I have a patient and family complaint, I can certainly um, empathize with that individual and say, yeah, that must be frustrating that that happened to your family member, you know, or, you know, I, I would be concerned too, right? And so being able to validate those feelings that they're having um, uh, can really help. Um, and then, of course, um, it can we can still take a collaborative questioning approach when we're getting to that solutioning. So what would you like to see happen? How can we make this work to move, move forward? So again, bringing in that we are doing this together. Uh, I'm not saying this is what should be done. Um, so those are just a few of my hot tips. What I would remember is, is that conflict does not disappear. And in, you know, in certain situations, we should be, um, I would argue, we should be looking to, you know, practice our skills and be going for that, what we might feel as conflict, which is, you know, just these two differing opinions um, and um, being able to explore that with the other person. The struggle will not go away um, is, is a big one. So, you know, there's still, you know, issues or there's still times where I'm going, oh, I'm feeling sweaty or I'm uncomfortable or this, discussion starts going way off kilter, right? Um, but, you know, using those principles that feel right for you, that you've practiced, um, like you will get better at it and you will get more confident at it. And um, hopefully that you will have those more productive and authentic relationships. And again, hopefully you're having this, these purposeful and value add discussions. So, okay, tell me more about that idea. Tell me more about this concern. Oh, I didn't understand that that's the way that our situation worked or, right. And then we are able to do quality improvement or whatever that needs to be done in order to move forward. And then hopefully make the system better than, than how we left it. So, um, I just have a few things um, that I just want to bring your attention to. Crucial conversations is the big one. There are seven different steps. It talks a lot about it, the different um, things that you know I reviewed in terms of the, the questions. Uh, What's your problem is a great uh, book um, about how to reframe problems um, because sometimes the way we look at a problem will then dictate our solution. Um, so can that be reframed? 
And then um, the idea of the gap um, that was just so mind blowing for me and really changed my practice, uh, particularly as a leader, uh, was the book Conflict Without Casualties. All of these have podcasts. So if you Google into your favorite podcast thing, you Spotify, Apple, whatever, I don't know what, how many things there are there now, but um, there's definitely um, stuff that's in a more of a 30 minute block if reading isn't for you um, and that are really helpful. So there's lots of these free tools that you can use um, with, um, you know, that are reputable and um, are really valuable. That's great. Uh, thanks, Scott and Jesse. And uh, I'll invite uh, Bahar in. You're currently muted, uh, Bahar. Oh, very good. Okay. Um, and, um, you know, even though I was here during the last presentation, I continue to pick up new things. Uh, so thanks, Scott and Jesse, for 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 bringing us through those presentations. Um, and I hope everyone out there is kind of feeling the same. Um, these topics, these concepts require some kind of rehearsal, right? They require some practice. So hearing, hearing them again, I find really, really helpful. Um, so what, we're gonna jump right into the Q&A. Are, are you ready? Okay. Uh, Kate, Kate has one in the, uh, in the Q&A and um, uh, this came up during uh, Scott's presentation, but I think also relates to, to Jesse's as well. So um, uh, I'll just read it out. How do you suggest balancing preparing in advance while avoiding ruminating on it or over preparing? Excellent question, Kate. Sure. I know I, I have a reaction to that question, but um, I'm gonna... Um, uh, bring it over to Scott first and Jesse, and then Bahar will bring you in. What's your response to that, Scott? Oh, Joe, I wish I could hear yours first. Um, ah, I, I, okay. <laughs> I, 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 I mean, I'm, I, it's generally, it's it's a tough balance. Um, it's one that you kind of figure out functionally. I, I find it, it, the question would be, what did I learn the last time I rehearsed it? And if the answer is nothing, it's probably time to jump. Oh, okay. um, but yeah. I'm, I'm curious what you, because you. Uh, yeah, no, sure. I, and I'll, I'll, I'll just, yeah, because um, of that nice segue, I'll, I'll, I'll add, like when I read that, Kate, I was thinking, um, when you say prepare in advance, you know, as I was hearing Scott talk, I thought like this, this tool actually requires practice, right? You have to intentionally get out a sheet of paper and prepare. And so Scott, I like the way you, you walk through how you worked out that conflict with your neighbor. You had the sheet of paper out, didn't you? You wrote down the dear man, and you. And I think to have this kind of technique work for you, you do have to practice it. So, how do you do that without kind of avoiding like over preparing and ruinating? And my reaction was, um, first of all, you have to do it once, right? I would predict that the more that you do it, the rumination will probably shrink because you're actually doing something very intentional and purposeful. You're not just thinking about it, which will just add to the rumination. You're actually doing something um, that, that we would say is purposeful uh, as opposed to kind of like just non-productive worry and rumination. And the other suggestion, Kate, I would have is, and I don't know, Scott, if you ha uh, would agree with this, put a time limit to it. Say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do the exercise and, and I'm gonna do it for 15 minutes and then I'm gonna give it a rest, right? And that way there's a bit of a, like a worry control time. And we do this sometimes in our work with people uh, who struggle with worry. Um, so those are my reactions. I hope you found that helpful, Kate. Anyone else want to add in? Bahar, Scott, I'm or Jesse? I'm going to something, Joe, as well. Um, I, I think I mentioned just right after Scott finished uh, talking about the structure. I think um, when we think about doing these, um, courageous, crucial, or difficult conversations in a methodical way, we want to follow a structure, we want to reflect, we want to prepare. And as we go through this journey of learning how to be intentional when we're having these conversations, it, it becomes natural to us um, after a while. So 
Um, although you might need to sit down and, and actually write down the facts that you know, um, maybe in you know in in a few months you wouldn't you would not need to do that anymore. You can just reflect in your mind and you're already prepared. The other piece that I wanted to share is uh, the um, something that Jesse also mentioned uh, regarding having our emotions in control and really ground ourselves on the facts that we are given and not to. Um, the, 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 some of you might know about the facts versus story. So for us to have a uh, reaction to a situation, we need to have some, some amount of facts. So we know, okay, am I getting angry about this? Am I getting worried? Am I getting nervous? Um, how am I responding to something when we do have facts about it? But in reality, for example, the example that Scott has, uh, Scott doesn't have all the facts. So very naturally, we fill those gaps with our own story. So it's very good to practice to maybe not to fill those gaps with stories that we have in our own mind, or maybe fill it with something positive. So we can give the, the other person the benefit of the doubt while we're actually looking for some facts. So we don't get ourselves worked up with, with, you know, worry or nervousness or anger. Jesse, I know you um, unmuted yourself, but you want to add something. Yeah, I was also going to say like that's also a strategy that they teach in crucial conversations is is being able to share the story that I'm telling myself is mm. when, you know, when this happens, I don't feel cared for or, you know, like you're you're then stating it. It takes, you know, courage to be vulnerable, um but that's definitely one of those words that I that I use that this is the story that I'm telling myself when this is happening. And then they're able to then come in with these are the facts from my perspective or what have you, but that's definitely a strategy that I use. I was going to add like with the due date as well, if you're going to have the set the due date also for the conversation, like put it in your calendar, I'm going to do it by this date because then or else like it's going to go on for weeks and weeks and weeks. Um, and then I think to remembering that it's a discussion. So it doesn't have to be finished at that one and done uh, meeting, right? So I generally think of my first time going into the the first meeting, if you will, um, as we're just having a discussion and we're just understanding the facts, right? We're just trying to understand the other person's perspective. If that's all you get to, great. Then we're going to try something else like later, right? Maybe it's, you know, and then you're kind of testing it out like, okay, that was too heated. Maybe I need some help. I need to rethink this, like, you know, et cetera. Um, but uh, don't expect like your first few times, I think, to get through and feel like, okay, this is now end. This is now done. This is a multiple, generally, it's a multiple conversation thing that happens. Wonderful. Very, Thank you. Hopefully can that's helpful. All right. Another question. This one is coming from Will. How would you prepare or handle micro conflicts smaller conflicts by the same person over time all right well good question how annoying <laughs> all right um when you start picking this up um, that you're working in an environment where you're picking this up with a particular same person over time um, opening it up to the panel around reactions to that one Just in terms of using the dear man tool, that's an excellent describe, right? The, hey, I noticed a week ago this happened, and yesterday this happened, and today this happened. That's yeah. a describe. They may nice. or may not agree with those shared facts, but likely that's where you'd want to be introducing that repetitiveness as as part of your description. Uh, with these just with these repetitive kind of micro things too, it's always easy to kick the can down the road because like, well, I can just do it next time that this happens. Mm. Um, my encouragement would be sooner is usually better because if you go a little too if you if you express it too soon, yeah, I mean the risk is that you have an awkward conversation. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say, Scott. That you know all these micro things, um, it's better to talk to them the you know the first or second time it happens, right? And just to to get it um, to get it out in the open because when you come to somebody and you have six 
concerns. This happens six times. That's going to feel like getting hit by a bus. Like, cause we're asking mm-hmm. for maybe somebody to be accountable for something that they didn't know um, maybe was happening or those sorts of things, or that was their intention or cause we're going to assume that everyone is out here doing the right thing, wanting everyone to be, you know, not have conflict, et cetera. Um, so I think like that would be my, my piece. And if, um, like from a management perspective as well, I think then we're starting to look at, you know, a just culture framework. So if we are willfully disregarding, you know, the behavior norms or whichever, and it's happened multiple times, then we're going to be moving into something else because we've tried coaching and supporting and doing all the, all those other sorts of things. Um, so if you're in a role that wouldn't be in management, then that would mean escalation, right. To somebody to help you. Um, to uh, address those concerns. Well done. Well, Thanks. that you found that helpful. Yeah, you know, Scott, I was also thinking about like the other aspects of Gearman around this particular situation too. And you mentioned you mentioned broken record, and it made me think of you know other assertiveness type uh, stances that one can take and. Um, it's it's a it's an important skill, isn't it? To, to to be able to practice coming to your same point, because if this is a repetitive thing, they 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 need to they need to hear it in a in a a way using the describe, but also in that I believe it's in the, um, the mindful uh, section too, in, in terms of uh, you, you may have to stick to your point frequently, uh, repeat it like that broken record. All righty. All right. So um, I hope you found that helpful, Will and Kate, uh, before that. Um, uh, and uh, I'm not seeing any brand new questions. Um, you know, we, we've been reflecting on, on questions from the last session as well. And, 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 and I remember someone brought up the scenario where uh, there's conflict and it involves, you know, a clear power differential. Um, and so very tough kind of scenario. And, and we had various responses to that, including, you know, reviewing aspects of uh, psychological safety. Um, but but curious uh, with the panel, uh, any upon further reflection, anything to add around Dealing with conflicts where there's there's like this defined power differential, maybe like with your boss or a superior. Scott, you're off mute. I didn't know if you had something first. No. Got to remute. Go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I I you know I thought about this a bit more after that conversation for sure, and. Um, can definitely appreciate the you know the challenge and and yes I think the 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 idea of safety like you have to feel safe uh in order to sometimes to bring forth those concerns you don't want there to be repercussions and that makes it kind of extra uncomfortable um and so I would look within your organization or whichever of who are your supports or who are your resources in order to to help you have those conversations. Um, we do have an escalation process like here at St. Joe's. So if you're not getting the answer that you want, who do you go to next? Um, or and like you don't feel it's being dealt with, you don't feel like it's being um, you know taken seriously, et cetera. Um, so what are your other options? Um, when you go and you, you speak with somebody though, I, I would definitely say, make sure that you have your, your feelings in check. I think that's really helpful. Um, and that, you know, using what, like, like an SBAR format or like the dear man format, right. And being really clear on what is the purpose? What is the, my goal of this conversation so that, um, you're feeling a bit more confident, um, when you go in and speak with, uh, your, your boss. And you know, trying really to keep it to the facts, and again, the story that I'm telling myself, or the the you know, being able to share those those pieces, um, and uh, you know, as well as you know, asking for help, asking for the help that I need help from you in this way. So, what is like that in um, as far as what I always go back to, but the you know, what's the recommendation? What is your request? What is the thing that you're looking for from your superior? 
that that was really great, Jesse. Um, there are multiple other questions are coming in, but I would love to actually add something to this piece as well. For for those of you who have um, who lead leaders, also it's important to to realize that um, the power differential can come from um, official leadership positions, and it's it's important for us to realize that. Uh, leaders do need official trainings. They do need to gain some skills. Um, so they are um, open to feedback that they are providing the psychological safety, uh, safe environment to their team members. So they do not feel that um, if there is a conflict, they cannot go to their uh, quote unquote superior. So if you are in this position to promote um, leadership skills, uh, including being open to feedback, um, that is something that I would recommend uh, that you promote for your uh, leadership team members as well, because that definitely is something mm -hmm. that would be very helpful uh, in the leadership journey for any anybody in a, in a management position. Yeah, and uh, while you're waiting for that, I generally just like the, the I guess the process that I took was is that the other person should be speaking more than myself. So I'm doing more listening mm. as the as the leader, um, and the other person is doing more talking. So that's generally, at least my approach. If I feel like I'm talking too much, mm -hmm. then I'm not I'm not doing I'm not helping the situation. That's wonderful. Yeah. That's wonderful, Jesse. Thank you. With this uh, this question was one that stuck with me. This notion of like power differential. I, yeah. I have other questions too, but it, it really was. It kind of it was is in the back of my mind a lot. Thinking about this after we our conversation, and the thing that stuck with me is that I think what we're talking about today is more about uh, technique or tool, and technique and tool is in addition to ethic, not in substitution for ethic. Hmm. So like, we can talk about how to have conflict better, but that doesn't justify the existence of the conflict or that the conflict should be leveraged on one person to keep addressing the conflict over and over again. I think about this particularly when it comes to things like, you know, race, gender, sexuality, historically disempowered communities, that they are often in the place of having to initiate a conflict and having a better tool for that and trying to initiate a better tool for that doesn't excuse or replace the necessity for equity, right? That this is rather a way to hopefully encourage that, but the tool can never kind of fix those concerns. And I, I hope that that's also something that we're kind of clearly outlined here when excellent. we're talking about conflict. That was excellent, Scott. Yeah, Scott, that's really helpful. Thank you. All right, Bader, do you think that it's took too long? It's, it's too long time to recognize how the pandemic affect the healthcare workers. How can we heal after all the hate that we got? Really? Oh, that's a big one, Bader. Um, there's no question uh, that, you know, we're all still recovering here, hey? Um, and um, how can we heal after all the hate that we got? From I, I also hope that that's in some ways buffered by uh, support that we've also received uh, from others that we work with and from the community. But um, it's going to take some time for that recovery. I would encourage you, Bader, to continue to connect to groups like this. Um, I've been leading a lot of sessions with healthcare workers, and you know, we 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 repeatedly get this um, that they uh, benefit from connecting with others. You you need opportunities to kind of um, get some of this out into the open to get that validation from your healthcare workers that truly get what you're talking about. So that would be kind of my response to that, Peter. I know it may not be a fantastic response, but um, anyone else want to uh, add to that? I agree, Joe. We need to acknowledge that 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 was a trauma. So we need to take the steps to get through it, um, and that usually gives us the opportunity to look for strategies to get through it. Um, so the first step is the most important step. And if you ask me, it's 50% of the process, which is acknowledging that, that that is a trauma that we need to address. So I absolutely agree with you, Joe. Yeah. And, and Bader, one thing to kind of look for too is something called the 
Healthcare Salute, thank you for your service. These are sessions that are um, that are also run by some of our colleagues here at St. Joe's, uh, Dr. Margaret McKinnon in her trauma lab, working with healthcare workers. And I find those are also really good opportunities. Uh, Scott or Jesse, any further uh, additions there? No, y'all covered that well. Okay. Um, uh, Will is asking, okay, patient's family is trying to be too involved in a patient's care, but they are not the power of attorney. Is this a simple case of escalation or is there a way to address this type of conflict? So in a kind of a, a care setting. Hmm. Yeah, it's so important to be able to establish these boundaries now in, in healthcare. Um, anyone from the panel want to jump in on this one? This is a simple le legal scenario. So the, the law, the healthcare consent law is very clear on who uh, can be involved and what type of decision making um, for for others. So as, as long as we establish that and we understand uh, the law, uh, then as healthcare providers with that knowledge, we are also responsible to, to provide that sense of um, uh, bringing people together, providing them with the education that they might not know. A lot of people might not understand the role uh, when it comes to uh, healthcare consent uh, and capacity and substitute decision making. Um, so being compassionate, being able to provide that kind of education with compassion to people usually de-escalates the situation, but it's never easy, um, especially when there are some um, financial matters involved. So um, it is it is sometimes it is necessary to bring some experts such as an ethicist uh, to the to the table. Uh, but usually it's it's the legal versus ethics matter um, because the healthcare law is very um, clear on that. I don't know if anybody else wants to add to it. Yeah, I would just make sure, you know, is this escalated to the appropriate people within the organization? So for example, manage their manager, maybe patient relations can help get involved. Um, again, the ethicist um, to have those conversations and, uh, you know, having that family meeting, be able to sit down and say, okay, so, you know, our understanding is the power of attorney. This is the, you know, how we work within those confines, um, you know, in terms of setting up boundaries, what feels good for the team in terms of, okay, so if the POA is going, then we're going to speak with the POA and the POA can then disseminate that information and like vice versa, right? So having, you know, if you have questions, then the POA can come in. Um, and be that centralized person to then come to the healthcare team so that there isn't confusion because we want to make sure that you know your loved one is feeling cared for and that you're getting the accurate information and what happens is when we you know have a multiple people at the table there, there might be too many cooks in the kitchen and we want to make sure that everyone's clear on what's happening and so that you know you can feel good that your loved one is being cared for. So those are the types of like conversations, again, going back to like, I hear like the gap is I'm maybe I'm not getting the information that I want from, you know, about my family member or the gap that they're experiencing is, is they're scared, you know, of, of what's happening to their family member. And so they're just trying to do what they think they should be doing, which is asking questions or getting involved, et cetera. So it's validating those feelings and saying, yep, this is the gap here's how we can fix that gap in a different way in line with the legal system, as well as, you know, making sure that you're getting the information that you want and that we're able to care for your individual appropriately. So. Great answer. Thank you, Jesse. Yeah. Thanks, Jesse. I think we'll take, uh, we'll take one more. We have one more here and um, I'm, I'm just mindful of the time, but, um, and I think this is kind of a practical one. Someone asking about, you know, how, how do you negotiate work if you're applying these techniques with the service provider that you are paying for and you have expectations of the service, like dealing with work being done around the house, a haircut, waitress, et cetera. Um, I think, you know, I, I think the message from us is that you can apply these tools in these very practical situations. Um, and, um, uh, you know, to me, the technique that comes to my mind around these kinds of scenarios is broken record, but um, I, I don't know if I if if other members of the panel could quickly just jump in on this one for an anonymous attendee. Good 
I think this would be a great example to test your deer man uh, piece, right? Because uh, if it's like a like the service or the haircut or something like that, mm-hmm. okay, well then I'm gonna find I'm gonna go and find somebody else, right? And especially in healthcare, it's maybe not about a patient or you know someone's life or something like that. This is a great way to practice. So um, I think it's the same stuff that we've been saying, right? What are the facts? Like here's, you know, this is my, or I'm frustrated because, or, you know, my expectation or my understanding of, of what was going to be happening, right? What are your thoughts about that? How does that resonate with you, right? Like those sorts of things. Um, so I, I would say the similar stuff, but use these opportunities, <laughs> To, yeah, to, sure. But even though, like, I would say I'm probably, I feel much more comfortable in the healthcare sector doing it oh, versus yeah. that. I'm like the person's like, please don't send the food back. But, um, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, yeah no, know. it's a great opportunity to do that. And we, and we often use pra- very practical, like service oriented scenarios when we do assertiveness training uh, type work. Like, you, you know, you buy a toaster and, and you bring it back and the toaster doesn't work. How do you practice these skills in returning your toaster? I, I know it's an example, but um, so I hope anonymous attendee, you know, our message would be, you know, practice some of these skills, practice like a dear man kind of skill, see how that goes uh, with this kind of scenario. And um, we would predict that it might, might work very effectively. Um, all right. So we're going to, we're going to bring the session to a close now. Thank you so much for all of your uh, participation today. Um, you've seen the slide with uh, the resources there. Jesse, thank you for uh, also putting up resources around, around getting more skillful around managing conflict. There are excellent programs out there. Um, and she's mentioned a few really good books and podcasts and packages um, where you can uh, enhance your skills here. There are some survey questions here uh, for our evaluation. They're on the screen right now. Uh, I would just ask you, if you haven't jumped off, please don't uh, wait yet. Question number one, um, I, I don't, I think people can probably read that. Is that right, Rana or Shopee? Yes. Okay. Thirty seconds more for the first question, and then we'll launch question number two. Okay, and we're launching question number two now. Fifty seconds more. And thank you for your participation. All Thank right, you to all of you for participating. Thank you, Jesse, Scott, dear Joe, and Shilpi. Um, it was a great session. I, I learned again through the session, um, and I look forward to practice what I have learned um, and looking through some of those uh, resources that you have shared with us. Um, mm-hmm. I hope that you all found uh, this session um, useful as well, and you are more than welcome to connect with us and go through the uh, previous sessions that we have uh, uploaded as well. Yeah, thanks uh, everyone for joining. I know we're 
who are from so many different sectors here, uh, from hospitals to public health to community, primary care. Um, again, stay well, everyone. Thank you for, for hanging in there and for all your service. Uh, and uh, we hope to see you during the next installment of the Hope Healing and Recovery Exchange for Hamilton Health and Community Care Work. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.